Pindia. For your information, the question and answer session will be conducted at the end of the session. Participants can ask by clicking on the hand icon on the toolbar of the GoToWebinar or there is a question panel in the bottom of the GoToWebinar window where one can type and we will answer the questions verbally. Else, you can contact me through the email ID given at the last of the presentation. All of the participants will be muted by default. But while asking question, when they raise hands by clicking the icon, we will unmute it through the administrator. We will have two sessions. The first session will be taken by me. My name is Suman Lahiri. I head the EBTC operations for the Eastern and Northeastern region. And the second one will be addressed by Mr. Kaushik Maitra, Managing Director of Suleka Works Limited. The webinar which I will be dealing with my session it deals about the northeastern India and discussion of public policy prescriptions of few important indicators and quickly we move to the implications, the location attractiveness, the implication for clean technology industry structure and EU clean tech businesses. We also discuss EBTC findings which we have witnessed in the clean tech mission in May 2013 followed by clean technology requirements, a case study and then finally Mr. Maitra will take care of the Suleka experience and here we go. So what is all about Northeastern region? It's about seven sisters and a beautiful small cousin which is in the extreme left hand portion as you can see Sakib. Arunachal Pradesh, Assam, Manipur, Meghalaya, Mizoram, Nagaland, Tripura. If, if we see borders, if we see the geographies, it is actually bordering the 94% of the boundaries of its international borders from China, Myanmar, Bangladesh, Bhutan. But it has a issue of the closed borders which actually used to provide its tremendous impetus in the pre-independence era when it was doing trade and it was a hotbed for international business. When these borders close, they stop. But that is one aspect which the government is working on to open. Besides this, the main question is why the EU SMEs should be attracted towards the northeastern India. Here we want to discuss a public policy document which is known as Vision 2020 document and which discusses the trend. And this document sincerely want to position the Northeast region as a region of economic eminence. The Northeast region has a comparative advantages in terms of rich in natural resources, dense forest and this has a high biodiversity. This region also sees the highest rainfall in the country and of course this is in the uh, Barak and the Brahmaputra Valley and also the Imphal River. So it's uh, surrounded by and nested by a large and small river systems and of course a treasure house of flora and fauna. Since, uh, one can see the type of comparative advantage 
And this particular document has also mentioned about the strategy of going forward. How to convert this convert comparative advantages to the competitiveness of this specific region. And which is of course is going to happen. And this is what is discussed in the next slide which says about the way forward vision 2020. Since the northeastern region has 84 percent of the rural mix, it is important that the deployment of the technologies, the deployment of the traditional systems has to be done through the grassroots people. And since the grassroots people are in the rural region, so there is an emphasis on agricultural productivity, but of course also non-farm avocations and employment. Not only agricultural productivity can bring the competitiveness of region, it should be supported by the industrial uh, progress in the region, but it has to be done by maximizing self-governance and grassroots planning, because we have to keep in mind that the rural section is the rural population is more than like 84 percent as I discussed before. And hence, as we can see, there is a comparative advantage with rich resources, so the development of sectors with comparative advantage has been a focus of this vision 2020. But it also speaks about investment in manufacturing units. And if we speak of investment in manufacturing units and also in agro-processing agro industries, it immediately calls for capacity development. And the human capital is one of the best assets to be developed. And we shall see in the indicators how it is uh, mentioned. And one will be amazed to see the interest you make in the Northeast. And yes, which is of course we mentioned that the connectivity in terms of infrastructure, railroad with waterways, or the recent modern internet connectivity, this has been also given emphasis in the Vision 2020 document with adequate resources. But this document says that financial resources are not a real issue to this department, to this region. So there is sufficient flow of financial resources in terms of government allocations. Said this, I would also like to highlight the climate change action plans and of course documents related to climate change action plans. All of these states have the climate change action plans and the documents in place which are speaking about energy, water, sustainable livelihoods, sustainable habitat, climate change perspective which is very much in line with the national climate change action plan at the federal level. And it is obvious that due to the sparse, due to the distributed population, rural population and due to the terrain, due to the natural resources, renewable energy, energy efficiency is one of the areas that is being spoken about in the climate change action plans followed by water. Although there is an abundance of water in this region, but the proper usage, the water is efficiency and the contamination removal becomes an important concern in the climate change action plan given the situation prevailing in the northeast. And of course, to improve the conditions of people's sustainable livelihood is important in this part. And climate change perspective is important as the symptoms of climate change in terms of radiation or rainfall, the temperature is becoming evidence. So to recap, the climate change action plans are pointing towards the introduction of clean technology which we will be slowly coming in to the picture. But before that, I would like to discuss a bit about the indicators. If we see these indicators, these are largely the macroeconomic indicators. If we see, this is uh, consisting of a, a big area. So if we see a northeastern region, Arunachal Pradesh has the biggest area followed by Assam. Population, it ranges from uh, 
31.6 to 31.2 million. Literacy rate I was talking about is quite high. Uh, compared to All India level literacy rate which is 74 percent, is a literacy rate is 67 percent to 91.6 percent in Mizoram. This has implications for the location attractiveness. And if we see the gross state domestic product GSDP growth, growth is uh, prevailing. There is uh, growth, yes, of course, the low growth in Manipur, but the growth is happening in the two digit. There is, if we talk about the infrastructure, we can see the install power base. We even see the broadband connection. Uh, there, there is a wireless connection. But I wanted to focus broadband kind of connection and which is picking up. There is national, there are national highways, airport connectivity is there, and we also witness the inflow of FDI equity. I will just take a halt at this point because this region was a hotbed of international business pre-dependence when they used to do the trade through the Chittagon port when Bangladesh border was open, and they were also doing trade with Myanmar. And now, with that social capital in place, it, is, it needs to be seen which is going to open in the future. But with this constant, still the location looks attractiveness which we are going to see in the next slide. So if we look into this model which is uh, Professor Michael Porter's diamond model, and if we see the four determinants, the factor condition which is uh, about the roads, the infrastructure, about the skill employed availability, if we see the demand condition and which are all these determinants related in supporting industries and even firm strategy and rivalry with two variables role of government and role of chance, how these dynamics are being witnessed in this location. From the previous slide if we analyze the macroeconomic in indicators and see with respect to these determinants and variables, we will find that the factors conditions and the demand condition as well as role of government is quite strong. And th these are some of the key factors which are also responsible in the development of other locations internationally. So this mechanism is available. If we speak about the Vision 2020 document, if we see the Climate Change Action Plan, those are in place. If we see the literacy rate, it's quite high. One may argue that the presence of the high literacy rate does not really turn into the competitive advantage. But the government policy, when it take care of this issue and brings in more uh, skilled uh, people or opens uh, excellent centers like the IIT IIMs, already Shillong, in Meghalaya has Indian Institute of Management, there is Northeastern Hill University. The improvement in connectivity is witnessed as we have seen in the last slide. This all says that the practice condition in terms of infrastructure, in terms of skill, labor is improving. And there is a substantial population of 0 0.6 to 31.2 million in each of the states. That means a customer base is there. We have also the local industries which is mainly strong in terms with the comparative advantage, whether it is in agriculture, it is in uh, power, it is in uh, metals, it is in horticulture, it is in sericulture. So there is a weakness of local industries which needs technologies to move forward. Yes, the related and supported industries needs to be developed and firm strategy, structure and rivalry, this mechanism of firm management which will be evidenced as we grow. So conclude this part, there are presence of this diamond of determinants of access condition, demand conditions, role of government, which is going to improve the rest of the, de the determinants and variables and hence contribute to the, not only to the attractiveness, but also the international competitiveness in the recent years, which is important to understand. I go to the next stage, what it means for the implication for clean technology industry. If we again examine the industry structure. Yes, there's a clean tech firms, there's an emerging presence. There are some firms um, which are now doing business in Northeast in terms of uh, solar or biomass. When we look at the customer, the presence of local industries as we have discussed in the last slide and the local people, they need 
the modern clean technology solution. What are the substitutes? The substitute is traditional carbon intensive solutions. And maybe this, this traditional carbon intensive solutions which have lower price is creating a sort of a barrier in front of the new clean technology solutions which is placed a little bit higher. It is also true for other places in India and maybe across the world. But if we examine the entry barrier which is quite low and it of course depends on the entry mode and here EBTC has a role to play and we need a supply need of to develop the clean technology industry there. In nutshell if we examine this particular framework the customer bargaining power is high which which is always there in the beginning of any industry but the entry barriers are lower and getting lower and with the absence of the supplier base there is a need and also the small presence of this population of clean tech firms there is a clear need there is a clear position for the clean tech firms to come entry and show the region a trajectory of low carbon intensity and it is continuously becoming attractive because of growing awareness about the government policies and the climate change symptoms which is occurring in place. Said this, what can be the impact for the clean tech businesses which we'll discuss in the next slide. So it has an implication for which business models to implement or follow in case the EU clean technology business wants to enter this market. Of course it wants to, it will depend on the entry mode. If we talk about the direct, it will be costed because one has to set assets, one has to buy assets that increases the price. But if a proper partner can be identified, then it is one of the best model to enter as per EBTC experiences witnessing in the last one or two years. And here we EBTC can support in the and developing a partner, identification of partner. Pricing, discovering cost structure is very important because the cost which is being offered in the European market may be not competitive with respect to the cost of the product with the product being available in this region. So that impacts on the supply chain decisions, how one manufactures, how where one manufactures, what is the location of manufacture, how one sorts and is a clear need of supply base and emerging small population of clean tech so a manufacturing decision can be, um, you know, locating inside the northeast uh, areas or nearer to northeast areas can be one of the issues. And it is also important the standards demonstration of products and services which are crucial for such type of entries, especially new technology sector. And of course, organizational and as well as project financing. The key message here is. It is attractive for technology, clean technology business, but with certain conditions, there are issues in entry mode pricing, manufacturing decision, and here, European Business and Technology Center, with its remarkable experience and support of the European Union small and medium enterprises, can play a very important role. It is an important platform for internationalization of SMEs. And what is what has EBTC witness in terms of in clean technology requirements, which will be this one our findings in the next slide. So we organized a mission to Northeast India where our partner was a front of our MOEZ and our local partner was Indian Chambers of Commerce. And we visited the states of Assam and Meghalaya. After the three days of deliberations, the site visits, we visited to water treatment plants, to dams, to power sector offices of NIPCO, we find that there are requirements in the area of energy and water. And more importantly, there is a tremendous desire to measure what type of resources are available. There was a need of water quality monitoring device, maybe it's a solar panel manufacturing or basin water management to use water uh, properly. Or the floating solar, which is a new concept altogether in India, or in green buildings. So if we see there was, we have witnessed there was a demand for the entire gamut of clean technology solutions. 
So if if we want to uh, say our opinion and looking at the trends vis-a-vis -vis the energy security, the climate change context, this region's pre-tech requirements has to manage um, or matched with the comparative advantage, the geography, the rural population, which is the maximum as I have, as I have discussed. And this can be in the area of biomass-based generation, micro-hydro generations, or solar-based energy efficiency applications, or water contamination treatments among the areas and tremendous arsenic contamination in water. The need to use water treatment plants, there is a problem of soil erosion, there is a problem of flood, so it has implications for irrigation, integrated water resources management. Then I believe personally that there is a huge application of biotechnology across the gamut of agriculture or horticulture or sericulture. So all the EBTC focus sectors in terms, EBTC covers, be it renewable energy, be it smart grid, be it water, water treatment, wastewater treatment, be it grid buildings, intelligent transport solutions, seeing the curvy roads, the mountainous terrains, the application of intelligent transport solution, resources system. There's a whole gamut of requirement in North this. And this can be developed with a suitable business model which one need to work with the local partners and here ABTC can play a very, very vital role. Said this, there were two case studies. One was the CL Terrace floating solar PV, which is of course developed with one of the Calcutta based company, the Clystone Electronics, and they are working there, they are talking to the government, not only in the northeast but also in the central part of India. And the site identification has been done. I believe they have gone even to the design stage. And here you see the collaboration being done in the EBTC office. And finally, there's an interesting case study of Aquacu which uh, and just two days back, they have concluded AquaQ is a Swedish uh, firm which is uh, trying to um, launch its products in advanced water quality monitoring devices to detect bacteria and then finally adapt to arsenic contamination. They have developed an ecosystem of distributor, manufacturer, software developer, and two days back, they've concluded the MOU with CSIR, that is Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, CGCRI, Central Gastronomic Institute in Kolkata. And with the help of them, they are going to develop the demonstration project. And this is one of the devices, as you have seen, has a tremendous demand in North East. And some of the challenges which I've already discussed, a suitable counterpart, identification of funding, or high cost of view technologies, adaptation of technology, which is most important point of where EBTC security is quite um, being tackled by EBTC and development of this business ecosystem um, for uh, the AquaQ, a Swedish firm, will be useful for the North East. Uh, technology requirements. With this, I would like to offer the next session to my friend, Mr. Kausik Moitra, who will be speaking on his Suleka experience. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shimon. Good morning to all the participants from Europe and good afternoon to the participants from India. I'm Kausik Moitra and I have shared you with you some of my experiences in doing business in Eastern India, particularly in the Northeast. First, I would like to say why Northeast? What are its advantages? It's a land of forest, a land of hills, and land of rivers, land of lot of water bodies, a land where there is connectivity problem, a land there where there are multiple ethnic groups and a land where there is a multiplicity of culture. The seven or eight states of Northeast have one similarity. All are very, very rich in natural resources. And all of them offer untapped market. Agriculture is the key to the survival of these people. They cultivate rice and some cash crops. Tea of Assam is world famous. And hence there is a lot of opportunity to tap these markets 
which are isolated markets, which are far away from the mainland, but which have got a lot of resources to offer. North is a region which is very vulnerable to this climate change. And with this, the opportunities for using clean tech becomes more and more dominant with the passing days. A few months back, the Supreme Court of India gave an order whereby use of fossils, fossil fuels in and around the reserve forest of Kajiranga. Kajiranga is a big reserve forest which is famous for one-horned rhinos, one-horned rhinoceroses. It's the only place in the world where you can find one-horned rhinoceroses. So the, by that order of the Supreme Court, a large region comprising of a radius of around 50 kilometers around Kanchenjunga Reserve Forest, you are not allowed to use any fossil fuel. Now there are a lot of industries, there are tea industries, there are other industries, what are they going to do? They have to use some clean tech. This gives us an opportunity. Another problem with Northeast is that since it's a land of rivers and forests and hills and mountains, whenever there is a natural disaster, whatever connectivity is there, it gets disturbed. So, it's a place which is quite unlike the rest of India. It's a place which requires a special thinking on doing business, on identifying opportunities. It's a place which gives you a lot of opportunities, particularly if you are thinking of decentralized systems. And in this respect, the things in which we are, uh, the things we are developing in through our company are getting, getting importance day by day. Decentralized system, clean tech systems can be, as you all know, can have a very wide range. It can be from a small lantern, solar lantern, bringing light to the homes of millions in rural India, a business which opportunity of hundreds and thousands of millions and it can go up to decentralized small solar PV plants, power plants or in the megawatt scale or in 100, 150, 200 kilowatt scale. This is the broad scope. Just to give you an example, as Shuman was telling earlier about agricultural prospects in the uh, northeast and the people doing agriculture, they are using water pumps, which are mainly diesel operated. The DG set uh, is there, they are using diesel to operate these irrigation pumps. Now the cost of diesel is shooting up and now people have started looking for alternate sources. We are experimenting with one solar irrigation pump. The power will be supplied by solar energy, it will be up or an operation say from for six hours a day and in the time of monsoon when there are rains you don't need this uh, so, uh, irrigation pump. So it can operate at a time when the monsoon is not there. It can operate a small pump, it can operate a big farm, it can be a movable system. So you are experimenting with it. So there's, that's an opportunity. There are opportunities in tea industries, the sprinkler system which are used to give uh, water to the uh, tea trees, they can be used using solar because this tea garden stretches for kilometers and kilometers and it's very expensive to bring conventional electricity by grid line or whatever to these places. So if we can offer them a solution, maybe the capital cost is more but the operating cost is less, maybe the capital cost is also not that high. So there are hundreds and thousands of opportunities. It offers hundreds and thousands of opportunities to anyone who is interested. Like the slide you are being shown, uh, we offered 1000 solar lanterns. We sold the solar lanterns to government and it was given to tribal families who were living in 
forest, deep forest, where they don't have any scope to get the grid connected electricity. Because of the environmental issues, you can't cut forests these days. You can't bring grid line to them. And even if you bring grid line, in case of a storm or something, it gets disconnected. And so for days, they don't have any power. So we offered them this solution and it was very well accepted. I'll show you another slide. Edmund, can you move to the next slide, please? Uh, this is near to uh, the urban populace. Uh, this petrol pump, uh, a gas station, it was commissioned using solar energy only. At that time, they didn't have uh, supply, grid supply there. And we designed the entire system. We commissioned this plant by using solar energy. Now, although they have the grid power, it's a backup. And they are not using DG sets. They are, the cock, they are using only solar power and it's been in operation for almost a year and uh, these guys are going to break even within one and a half years. So this is another opportunity that I am showing you. So there are varieties of things that can be done and in Northeast these things are very common. This is not in exactly Northeast, this is in West Bengal, just adjacent to Northeast where also there was a grid problem and we did it there. And you can get hundreds and thousands of such units in Northeast. Just a few days back I was talking to one of the one of my one people there in Northeast who has an establishment which runs on DG set. And he was telling me with the cost of diesel going up every day. As per the government of Indian poli India policy is going it's increasing every month actually. The cost of running the operation is becoming very expensive and he was asking me whether solar can be brought into place. And I asked him, what about this grid power? They said that there are times when we get grid power, but most of the time there is no power. So we are totally dependent on the set. And mind one thing that these units in the northeast, particularly the northeast, they operate in the morning only. They generally don't operate evening, in the evening or late at night. So basically, we can use the solar power directly to energize, to provide the energy required for this, um, uh, all these establishments and all these small factories or institutions. Next slide, please. And with next slide, please. Just to give you an example of uh, the existing power units of the Northeast, as you can see, there are two types of units. One is hydroelectric power plant and one is the gas-based power plant. The gas-based power plant is mainly on the eastern part, where uh, in the state of Tripura, Agartala is the capital of Tripura, so we can see the last two points, uh, Agartala gas shovel plant and Tripura gas-based power project, the, the, where the gas, natural gas is available. Then there is one Assam gas-based power plant, it's also on the eastern side of the state. But mainly, there are hydroelectric power plants, hydroelectric projects that were commissioned sometimes back. Next slide, please. I mean, next slide, please. Yeah. And there are some of the projects which are under execution. These are all hydroelectric power projects. But the problem with hydroelectricity is that uh, with the, now the environmental group raising objections because of environmental degradation. This hydroelectric projects, execution of hydroelectric projects are becoming a problem. People don't want to go for hydroelectric projects these days. There are a lot of environmental issues, you need a lot of clearances. And again, these, these hydroelectric power plants also you need a distribution system, which has to cause this entire terrain, rugged terrain, a terrain of hills and forests. So the problem of distribution is always there. Next slide, please. I will show you the slides. This is, this is the transmission and distribution loss. This is the official figure. As you can see, in some states, it's as high as 81%. On average, it goes to around 45 to 55%. So this is the transmission and distribution loss in North, Northeast India. This is the average figure, and this is the government figure. And mind me, the official figure 
puts the estimate by another 50 percent. So they say it's around 75 to 80 percent of the electricity produced is lost in transmission and distribution. I just showed you this slide just to emphasize the point I was uh, telling about distribution. Let me next slide please. Now coming back to the physical infrastructure. All the seven states are connected to a network of roads and with the four lane highways coming up in northeast. So the roadways infrastructure is going to drastically improve in a couple of years time. Railways are also expanding in the northeast and within a few years the entire area will be uh, well connected by roadways and railways. Next slide please. Airways, uh, since the roadways and, and the railways are not that developed as on debt, so there are besides Gohat which is the capital of Assam and the largest city in the northeast, there are seven domestic airports at Jorhat, Dibrugar, Shilchar, Dimapur, Aizal, Imphal and Agartala. This Dimapur, Aizal, Imphal and Agartala are the state capitals of four other states of northeast. They are only mainly connected by flights from Kolkata and Guwahati by ATR flights. Next slide please. Now, although we have this connectivity of uh, roadways and railways, the major problem of northeast is the rivers. There is a mighty Brahmaputra flowing coming from Assam, flowing through Arunachal Pradesh, then entering uh, Assam and finally flowing into Bangladesh. And there are only three bridges as of date, as on date, crossing this Brahmaputra. So there are two distinct regions of North. This one is the Northern Bank of Brahmaputra and the one is the Southern Bank of Brahmaputra. And it's very difficult to cross Brahmaputra unless you cross by these three points. Although there are river uh, transport available, but it's uh, very risky because of frequent storms in the Brahmaputra Basin. Now you can see from this slide that the power demand situation of Northeast. In this slide we are showing that this, the shortage, there is a deficit of only 6.7% or 134 megawatt during the last financial year. But the thing is that this is a figure based on, the shortage is calculated based on the distribution network available as on, as on debt. If you take the geographical area of the entire northeast and if you take the distribution pattern, we will find that 80% of the state doesn't have access to grid connected electricity. And the 6.7% deficit is only within the 20% areas where we have grid connected electricity. Under these circumstances, the government of India as well as people like us who are very familiar with Northeast and who have taken sessions on policy developments, we say to the government, it has been decided to em give emphasis on decentralized systems, decentralized power plants. That may be small power plants running from kilowatt range to a big power plant maybe in the megawatt range. Without the decentralized renewable energy systems, it is not possible to distribute power to the population of the state. And that gives a big, big business opportunity to all of us. It involves technology, it involves improved technology and it involves a lot of uh, other connections, other opportunities and it gives really a big, big window of opportunity for all of us concerned. Let me next slide please. 
As I was telling you, the hydro, this is the hydropower projects. Uh, you have to get clearance from Minister of Environment and Forest, National Board of Wildlife. You can't be within 10 kilometers radius of wildlife protected area, so it's almost impossible to get this. Next slide, please. So the solution that we have been working on in the northeast is a solar power project. So although it's a place where uh, you have a lot of rainfall, but this is now the only option. You can have a design based system design based on practical requirement. It's easy to install, controlled operation. It's a standalone power source, almost maintenance free, and you can at least get uninterrupted supply in the daytime. And if you have a battery backup, a lot of power at night as well. Next slide, please. So the importance of uh, solar power projects in the Northeast is so much right now. It's not only being taken up by the seven states of Northeast, but also by the federal government of the country. It's uh, the government has decided to give huge subsidies to anyone who is willing to set up a plant, solar power plant, in the Northeast. Next slide, please. What is our advantage? Although we are a farm based in Kolkata, we are a farm which is over almost 80 years old right now and have a very good brand image. We have a network of 400 plus distribution points across the seven states of Northeast. We have very high brand equity. We are well known to every corner of the state. We have a very credible presence and we have our own setup, own offices in different locations of Northeast. So that is our advantage in Northeast and we are working in Northeast, we are working in various uh, other uh, products with various other products in Northeast and we are also working on solar products and solar projects in the Northeastern part of the country. With this I will would uh, conclude my presentation and if you have any question you can ask us. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so you said the rules for question and answer session. People can raise hands as I mentioned by clicking the hand icon in the GoToWebinar site or ask from question panels by typing or maybe they can contact me over email. Yes, uh, Mr. Johan Quartier, please ask. Yes good, yes, good afternoon to you. My name is Johan Quartier. Yeah. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Good, uh, good afternoon. Johan Quartier from the Belgo Indian Chamber of Commerce. We uh, recently, uh, only a couple of weeks ago, we had a visit of 25 Indian majors and city uh, managers. Um, it was very clear there's a lot of opportunities uh, in both directions uh, to develop business. Uh, we have to thank EBDC uh, with uh, Mr. Srikar Dole who, de who had headed this um, uh, expedition, I would say, through Europe. Yes. Um, interesting things were happening. They paid some visits and it was interesting for all parties. Of course, um, we as a Belgian and Chamber of Commerce we um, would like to take the opportunity to inform next year or to as a following action to that uh, visit to have a seminar on green technologies together with EBDC and also a seminar on biotech. We did that already in the past but in this case, in this case we would involve EBDC as well. And also we are planning to, uh, there is a visit of the uh, Belgian, there is a Belgian mission to India within a couple of weeks where we have uh, the, the Belgian princess uh, Astrid and we'll um, uh, have the opportunity to sign a signal, an agreement with uh, uh, EBDC and this is uh, in, in the planning phase. Just want to inform you. Thank you. Excellent. And uh, thank you very much, Johan. And we will inform uh, Mr. Dole. And if you need any help, any support, please let us know, either Mr. Dole or me through email. I look forward to the cooperation. Thanks a lot. Yes, Mr. I think uh, Divya Lad, um, you have a question. Yeah, uh, this is Kushal Sharma here. I am Divya's colleague. Okay. Uh, we are calling from uh, Messe Frankfurt, India. And uh, 
uh, I have a very basic question though. Uh, I would like to understand uh, how do you uh, define clean tech? Because uh, the second presentation I understood was about clean energy. But when you say clean tech, do you also mean uh, wastewater treatment technologies or better industrial uh, processes or industrial technologies cutting across sectors which are cleaner? Yes, uh, thank you, my Kushal. Um, a, a very good and interesting question. Uh, when, when I talk about clean technology, uh, to answer your question, yes, uh, all the basic uh, technology which contributes to a cleaner environment in terms of reducing greenhouse gases or reducing pollutants to a form of liquid, they all fall under clean technology. For example, the, the technologies which you mentioned about water, water treatment, which I also mentioned in my presentation, apart from renewable energy, all comes under the gamut of clean technology. So it may be, for example, in energy, it may be renewable energy applications, it may be smart grid, it may be energy efficiency. Why energy efficiency? Yes, it can make the appearance, it reduces the coal, even coal burn technologies to burn less amount of coal. So that also fall under clean technology. Water, water treatment, wastewater treatment, these are all under clean technologies. And so, and so resource efficiency or uh, some kind of like acid recovery uh, in metal finishing sector, those also will uh, be under clean tech. Yes, resource efficiency, yes, because if we take example of clean coal technology, it basically addresses the clean coal. We need to burn a less amount of coal if we have a more efficient power system. So any any industries across okay. all the sectors which can any technology that want that actually uses to reduce the consumption of energy or consumption of water that is reducing the water footprint or carbon will come under the gamut of clean technology. Thank you so much, Suman. Mention now. My pleasure. Okay. The next can be asked by Pierre. Please introduce uh, yourself. Yes, this is Pierre Dubaret from uh, Another Time in Paris. Yeah. We are a manufacturer of uh, organic racking cycles, which is um, a, a power plant converting heat into power. And uh, what um, our interest uh, in this uh, webinar is uh, related to biomass power generation. Yeah. And my question is uh, to have more uh, uh, details about uh, the feed-in tariff. If there, is, if I understand there is some kind of uh, not a feed-in tariff, but some kind of uh, of subsidy for biomass uh, uh, power, and I'd like to know more about this. Uh, I also uh, would like to know if you have some details about the regulations in general regarding uh, uh, biomass power or, or uh, combined heat and power production uh, in this region. Yeah, uh, thank you. So, so, so can I answer this? Yeah, uh, just uh, I would like Koshik to answer. Just I, uh, there's some basic uh, answer to uh, Pierre is yes, uh, regulations are there uh, with the different regulatory commission which exists in not only Northeast but all the parts of India and there is a pricing of biomass commission and those uh, can be available for the Northeast also uh, but the regulations has to be checked. If you can send me an email I can help you to get the regulatory uh, uh, you know documents and also I will connect you with our energy sector specialist Mr. Who can be a great help for you? And Koshik, you can please answer the question. No, yeah, it's a very interesting question, and uh, what you have already covered what I wanted to say. And uh, the other thing is that this northeast region is very, uh, very high. There is very high potential regarding this biomass, and uh, they will be welcome there, I believe. Uh, okay, can I add one question? Sure. Um, um, are there already some uh, um, biomass pr projects, uh, power projects, which have been made uh, locally? And what would you see as the relevant uh, project size? Uh, I mean, typically we are considering uh, uh, megawatt scale or, uh, or ha some hundreds of kilowatts uh, scale at least. 
and uh, uh, what is the relevant size from, from your point of view? Uh, okay, sir, uh, just to answer this point, I think you shouldn't think of megawatt scale in that uh, region. If, rather, rather, if you can concentrate on multiple 50 kilowatt, 100 kilowatt units, it will be more beneficial and you can have the inputs for that readily available. Uh, th that should be the scale we will be looking at. But anyway, once you uh, send Shumon a mail, I will forward it all to, also to the government of Assam and uh, I will try to find out their and assess their views on uh, how they want to approach and we can get back to you. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Uh, Pierre, uh, please to send the email to me which, you, which uh, uh, we will be providing. Uh, you see, or you can go to EBTC website or you can write it to Lahiri, L-A-H-I-R-I at ebtc.eu. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the next, yes, please. The next question is asked Jela, and he he speaks about mode of entry. His question is whether EBTC prefers the mode of entry to be licensed technology to local players or direct participation by technology holders. Rajiv, to answer your question, the entry mode depends on the company and the case-to-case -case basis. If, if the company is a small unit, generally they prefer a local partner. In some cases, we have also found in CFBC Boiler, where Rafako and a Kolkata-based company, Hari Machines, they have gone through the licensing mode. So it really depends on the need of both the companies uh, working together, which sector, which market, which product. But if you want to discuss more, we can take it forward. Please write an email to me and let me know your requirement, where you are, have a specific technology requirement. The next question is raised by Mr. Ankur Agarwal, he is asking with respect to biomass projects, isn't there a law against land procurement by people outside of the region? This would strongly affect anyone looking to plant biomass for any region. Ankur, uh, uh, there are issues, yeah, you can, if you want to answer, please do that. Yeah, as per regulations, you cannot take tribal land unless you have a tribal partner. But there are a lot of lands which are in the hands of the government, which you can always lease from the government. So it's not a major issue. And in biomass sector, you can also work with a local partner, and like a tea garden, tea garden owner, you can have a lot of space there. So I, I don't think land is an issue because as you can, uh, if you remember Shuman's slides, you will see that uh, this region is one of the most thinly populated region of entire India. So, uh, and uh, it's a vast region, land shouldn't be an issue here. Yeah. Okay, Shumar. Yeah. Thank you, Koshik. The next uh, question is raised by Mr. James Gardina. He's uh, talking about funding support for microgrid, say, solar wind hybrid and why, where to find information. Uh, James, uh, one interesting part is the hybrid part of uh, solar wind. Uh, wind, I think in northeast there are pockets, but very less, not like the uh, west, coast, west coast or the coastal areas. Mm -hmm. Mapping is there. But if, if you think about a hybrid like biomass solar, and, and that can be done. And if there are schemes, um, which can be found at the MNRE website, Ministry of New and Renewable Energy website. And okay. that can be, um, uh, you know, it depends on what type of units or where is a specific region you are going to erect the plant. Uh, uh, if, if you can write and uh, to me and my sector mm -hmm. specialist, 
that we can help you further to understand sure. it and work with us. Yes, Koshi, please answer. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, thank you. His, his, his point is, uh, James, just be on the line for me. Your point is very interesting and uh, I think, Shuan, there is an opportunity for a hybrid system with uh, solar and wind, particularly if we look at uh, Brahmaputra Basin. There you have a lot of wind in a localized region. Yeah. And uh, you have a lot of sun. Uh, so if you go for a combined system or hybrid system, I think uh, that may be very interesting. And uh, James, if you can send a mail to Shuman, then we can have a look and uh, maybe we can take it forward. Okay, excellent. So James, what uh, you, ha you, you have an offer from Suleika of developing uh, a cooperation. So um, I can see a cooperation happening. So please send me a letter. I will not delay to form this. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Kushal, is, is that you again or Divya? Uh, yeah, uh, this is uh, Kushal yeah. and uh, thank you Mr. Shumon Lahiri and Mr. Kaushik Maitro uh, for the uh, enlightening answers. I have a question about the, uh, the solar uh, energy usage and feasibility in the, in the northeast which is understood to be uh, a place with heavy forest cover and uh, also good amount of rainfall. So, uh, has there been any statistical uh, study done to uh, ascertain the availability of sun on number of sunny days a year average? Uh? Yeah, that, that study is there. The study is with Indian Meteorological Department. So, uh, as you rightly pointed out, it's a place where there is a huge forest cover. But okay, forest cover goes up to 20 percent, maybe, maybe less than that. And the rest of the place, uh, there is no forest. And uh, well, the sunny days are less in number, no doubt about that. And it's true for anywhere in eastern India. And that's why what we have to do when we design a solar system to be implemented here, we have to have uh, more number of panels. I mean, we have to have a higher factor of safety for it to work properly. So that's the thing we have to take care of here. Uh, but what I would like to tell you, Kushal, uh, is that uh, there are lots of opportunities whether, whereby even after adding up this capital cost, you will uh, will the customer will be greatly benefited as you don't have to spend on diesel or any other uh, getting any other source of uh, supply grid and thereby he saves a lot of money that is the thing like I mean everything has a um, your advantage certain advantages the advantage in northeast regarding solar is that these days is that the cost of solar is less if you don't have a grid system nearby because if you don't have a grid, have a grid system nearby you require a supply energy from the supply grid then mm -hmm. as per the government policy you have to pay for the transformers or the distribution line everything and if you add that up you end up spending a lot 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 more of money so decentralized system particularly in the form of solar which is uh, readily available uh, mm -hmm. can be and is a very uh, good option for people of this part of the world and also in North Bengal, I am talking, talking also of North Bengal which is also maybe geographically similar, more similar to Northeast than to South Bengal. So we have been working in these regions and we have seen people just uh, taking up these projects, paying for these projects without any government subsidy and they are telling us, okay, we are getting back our money and very for that to very fast. So that's the opportunity. Thank you so much, Mr. Koshik Muitro. Thank you, Kushal. We have a question by Mr. Sandeep, uh, please. Yes. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Lahi. I We were actually um, looking at uh, distributed energy systems in the Northeast, uh, such as Pico Hydro systems and distributed biogas systems. Now, my question was, if we do have to look at a technology partner through EBTC, uh, to give us more innovative solutions to what we are already trying to do. How does the intellectual property uh, 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 region work out for you? I mean, do you help us with the entire IP uh, bit as well, or, or that's something that is relative to the companies who are talking to each other? Excellent question. I, I think I was expecting a question like this. Yes, 
in case of such partnerships we look forward to help the IPR issues and we have mm -hmm. a IPR help desk and Mr. Arvind heads IPR help desk and we will be a lot of use and we will be happy to deal with the issues of IPR when we deal with such type of technology transfer. Okay, okay, okay. That, that, okay. So ABTC does help with the entire IP part as well. So it's because we are a small company, so it is it is very important for us to hold on to the technologies that we are developing on our own, as yes. well as what we are tying up with in terms of European companies. So, and and if you can please uh, write an email to me, and I will put you in touch with Mr. Arvind Chopra, who can then take it forward, and he will be happy to help you. Absolutely, I will do that. I'll do that. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is again uh, put by Anku and he is asking uh, with regard uh, to fund financing. So he is mentioning that the projects, so the projects are either paid for by the government with PPAs like or the past of India by small households or businesses. How optimistic are financing organization in funding uh, projects in this region? Can you name some organizations, I believe, which actively fund any Indian uh, Northeast fintech projects? Ankur, uh, th this is an important part. And um, there, there are issues in financing. And especially uh, where government schemes are there, uh, financing is there. But where it is uh, done by private projects, it has to be uh, bring in by the, uh, the private party. That means the equity part has to be from the uh, VCs or anyone who is supporting. But the 70%, because there is a specific debt equity ratio for these projects, the 70s to 30. If, if we want to erect a solar plant, then the loan at the debt and the equity ratio has to be 70-30. Now, it depends on the risk perception. I didn't uh, the question is, this, this, this particular sector is looked at with a certain type of risk. And this is true for any of the projects. Because the Greek price, the cocoa distribution price, price a little bit lower, at rupees 5. But looking at the trend, when the coal prices are increasing, if we do nothing, then within five years, this sector will also get the same share of risk as the coal-based generation. So, if we do not think, the price of grid-based generation will increase and become equal to the moving down trajectory of the, uh, you know, the renewable energy sources. So, at this moment, the risk perception is a little bit higher, and PPAs are available from government, but the scrutiny is being done. But for distributed it depends on how innovative is your business model, how you, you are designing your business model to collect revenue from there. Maybe Koshi can give a very good example of this, that how they are selling their solar home systems or doing projects in the Northeast. It will take a long time, Shivan. Okay. But we don't have the time for it today. But yeah, you can, you, can always, you can always take up the challenge, you can try that. Like in my case, uh, I never go for government subsidies. What I offer, I offer, I offer at the best price. And my customers, if they're willing, they're going to they purchase it. And um, uh, till that, we are selling products, I mean, selling projects as well. So everyone is happy. So I don't uh, look at a project from a subsidy point of view. It's uh, let's uh, develop the business model accordingly. Yeah. Let's really go for subsidy. Yeah, funding, uh, Ankur is asking about funding organizations like banks. Yes, there is the Northeast and the Development Banks there, uh, but, but there are again uh, PFC, the, uh, which is a bank related to power sector financing, rural electrification, those can be approached. But particularly for these sectors, we have to identify. If, if you write to me, I can work for this and let you know what are the organizations that are specifically on not this. Thank you very much, Ankur.
So, if there are no, no questions, I would like to conclude this session. I'd like to convey my thanks to everyone, to every participant who has attended this webinar. I also thank Mr. Koshik Mehta, who is kind enough to come and spare his valuable time to speak to you all. Thank you all. You have a lovely day. Bye-bye. Thank you, Shuman. Thank you, all the participants.